And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Raghunath, also known as Ray Capo, renowned musician who founded the hardcore punk band Youth of Today. He abruptly left the band, embarking a one-way journey to India, living as a monk in Verendavan. He immersed himself in spiritual culture, encountering extraordinary characters, experiencing moments of divine connection, and more. Hmm. Raghunath, thank you for joining me, and welcome. Uh, great to be here. Thank you. So when you're in Youth of Today, you're singing more about positive things, like betterment and better living and positive attitude kind of music. Was that really what most of the punk scene was singing about back then? No, the, the, the punk community was, first of all, was an alternative community to corporate rock and mainstream music. So that's what I was attracted to. I was attracted to, I don't fit in there. I want to find my own path. And um, the more I got into punk, the more I realized, well, uh, the ideas behind it are very either political or they're um, uh, pointing fingers at the problems with the world, which is sometimes it's good to shine light on the problems of the world. But we can't solve problems by pointing at the problems without doing something. And then also, if we start to get introspective, we start to realize we have certain control. Sometimes I point to other problems, but I'm, 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 I'm the problem as well. I've got the same problems out there that are within me. And so I had a big inspiration at a young age, and I don't know how I got it. Just, I don't know how I got it, but I was into personal self-betterment. And I, I realized there are certain things I can control. Some of them are what I put in my mouth, what I put in my eyes, what I put in my ears. And so I felt the real self-betterment could be, hey, how can I be an example of betterment in the world? So our band, Youth of Today, <clears throat> They started propounding these ideas of clean living, a clean lifestyle, positive thoughts, um, the idea that our, our, our actions have a reaction, uh, and seeing spirit in every living being. And I started getting diving into these books of uh, Eastern thought, metaphysics, um, uh, all that cl classic literature was sort of an inclusive understanding of uh, spirituality. And that's sort of what drew me into Eastern thought and eventually quitting that band and going to India. Speaking of quitting, wasn't your band at the height of success? And if so, how are you able to just walk away from it all? Uh, I think I probably re had to weigh out what success was. And perhaps it had some type of success in, in a material sphere. But if your heart isn't fulfilled, then are you really successful? Yeah, yeah good point. <laughs> if you're getting more accolades and uh, the ladies think you're cooler and more attractive mm -hmm. and the, you're, you're making money before you used to pay money, now you're making money. Is it really successful if what you've got, you've climbed that ladder of success and you just still feel, I don't feel any better about myself. In fact, I'm more bothered and agitated and envious and competitive. So that was always sort of gnawing at me. And I, I don't think I'm alone in this. I think I deal with very successful material, really um, successful people on the regular because I take transformational pilgrimages to India or to Nepal or do teacher trainings of yoga. And I meet people who are very expert at what they do, but they, they, develop a dissatisfaction or they they don't even want to be they've climbed the ladder of success and they realize that ladder is leaning against the wrong wall when they get to the top and they're stuck they're stuck with all the accoutrements of success but they feel well inside i feel like a little empty or i feel like you know i've done i've put in the time i've spent the resources to get here but i don't want to even be here and so I, I, I see it in other people. I saw it in myself. And I think we have to do the, the more important thing, which is climb down that ladder and see where I want to be, where I want to be at the end of this year, where I want to be in five years from now, in 10 years from now, who do I want to become? And I think that's an important part of our self-evaluation. 
um, when we become, when we, when we really called to be, uh, um, figure out our direction and our, traje- where we want uh, our, the, our trajectory in life is pull over our speeding vehicle and just reflect and check the map and make sure we haven't missed our exit, so to speak. So I guess most artists would assume success is money and fame. And once they got it, they thought it was going to bring them happiness, but perhaps they're still unhappy. I, I can't speak for every artist, but I think I can't remember which Greek. I think it was Socrates who said there's three reasons why material success won't fulfill us. And one was that you want something, but you never get it. And we, maybe we've been in situations like that where we really think if I could just get this, I'd be happy. And we're frustrated because we don't get it. That's one reason why the desire for material fortune doesn't fulfill us. The second one is we get it. We get what we want, but we lose it. That happens. If you finally got it and then you lost it, you were famous and then you lose your fame or you've become a has-been, or a one-hit wonder. Another thing, or you get fired or laid off from your dream job. Another one is, and the third one is, you want it, you get it, but it doesn't live up to your expectations. And I think I think that's the sort of the category I was in. I wanted it, I got it, but this, I thought I'd be better off now. I thought I'd be more enlightened. And so... Um, simultaneously, I was studying the books of spiritual saints and mystics, and I thought, you know what, I, I, I want some internal type of joy. There's nothing of this world that will make me happy. There's no amount of stuff that will make me happy. And I, w- I was getting more and more pulled into a direction of Eastern thought because it seemed like a much wider gate in understanding spirituality. It didn't seem like um, an exclusive path. It seemed a more inclusive understanding of spiritual life. And in that path, you know, this is a podcast on paranormal things, which I was always interested in also. Um, what is, is the, what is heaven? What is hell? Are those things real? Is it figurative? What is, what is, um, wh- what is the soul? What is, where does the soul travel to? Um, d- d- does the soul look like me? What is reincarnation? Is reincarnation real? Um, what is life after death? Are my family actually related to me? Um, what's the, what are we supposed to be doing while we're here on this planet? Simultaneously, in the in the success of my music, my my father died, and it, it was quite shocking because he wasn't really that old. Truthfully, he was only a few years older than I am now, and that started making me lose faith in the material world. Like this is a place where uh, all our dreams get taken away from us. It sounds a little depressing, but if we actually analyze the material world, how can we be happy in a temporary place? Like how, how can I like enjoy my home if I know my home could collapse at any minute? So this type of thinking can either dr- drive you to either type of existentialism or type of deep woven, uh, uh, rooted anxiety, or it can, you know, catapult you on your spiritual life. And for me, it catapulted me on my spiritual life. The, the the failure of material success, the failure of material safety, those things were like a trampoline of my spiritual um, journey. And I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes those, those, those so-called tragedies can be like the greatest gifts you receive. Well, you pack up all your stuff and you fly over to India. And obviously this is pre-internet. I mean, what do you do when you get there? I mean, how do you figure out where you're going to go and how you just (laughs) just show up at an ashram? You you write them an airmail back then before there was uh, WhatsApp or before there was uh, email. You'd have to write an airmail letter to a person, wait for a response and you don't even know what you're getting into. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so yeah, it was a it was a little added extra adventure. Now there's a l- little bit more control you have as when you when we travel, we can just go online and I want to go somewhere and book an Airbnb anywhere in the world. Um in a city in the jungle anything. It was a little different to travel back then. 
And, and I think this generation will never quite get it because it's even hard to even reflect what it was like traveling without a cell phone, traveling without the internet yeah. and traveling without a credit card. Uh, and um, it added a little bit of sort of dependence and trust in the universe uh, that was a little, which goes hand in hand with your spiritual journey. Um, so yeah, I, I tell the story in my book. My book just, uh, is, it just got re released uh, a few days ago. It's called From Punk to Monk. And um, it tells my story of how I went from the band into figuring out I want to be, be on a spiritual journey now and see where this takes me. Hmm. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Have you ever seen that movie, The Razor's Edge with Bill Murray? No. I haven't seen a lot of movies, truthfully. Oh, oh, well, your, movie. your story reminds me of that story as a guy that came from, I mean, not exactly, obviously, but he came from a materialistic world of World War I and very, very rich. And he goes to war and it completely changes him and he becomes spiritual. And then he ships off to India to try oh, wow. to figure out his life. It's like the only serious movie I think he's ever done. I I built, oh, movie. Yeah. Uh, when you said Bill Murray, I was thinking of Stripes. That's no, what I remember. No, I yeah, it. it's a serious movie, and I I love that movie. And your life kind you of know, reminds in, me of India has India has been a hub of spiritual seekers for before before written you know before written time uh, before the history of you know uh, prehistory, and so there's always been searchers, and India has a, a vast canon of you know self reflective. Uh, uh, scriptures and wisdom literature, and it's always been a place for searchers. And so it it drew me in just from going to sort of these, you know, east west metaphysical bookstores in New York City when I was a teenager. I thought like there's some other hidden information here that's going to even shed light on how I grew up in my you know Catholic tradition, the Italian. New York family. Wonder what your mother thought about you. Well, she thought I was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> she thought I had lost my mind. I remember telling her that, uh, you know, I came back on Christmas Eve and I had like the orange robes of a sadhu and a shaved head with a, a tuft of hair and in the back of my head. And she said, I thought you were going to become a Christian monk. And I said, I am a Christian monk. And I said, if Jesus was here right now, he'd high five me. And then I had to explain. I said, mom, there's one God. There's one, whatever you call God, higher power source. Every culture has a different name. Like, like uh, uh, Shakespeare said, a rose is a rose by, by any other name. You give a rose any other name, it's still a rose. And so cultures have a different way. They have different rituals. They have different ways of um, understanding God, but there's one higher source, no matter what you call him. And it, to approach that higher source, you got to shed your fake self. You got to shed your costumes and every spiritual path will bring you to the same place. And only fools will bicker about, no, my path is right. No, my path is right. No, my path is right. It's like saying, it's like arguing over the different languages to say the sun. In my country, we say Surya. And in France, we say Soleil. And in America, we say, or in English, we say sun. Uh, it's all the same. We're talking about the same, you know, glowing globe in the sky. And you're going to fight about it? It's ridiculous. And we've seen this happen again and again with religion. And that's why there, there's a necessity to understand that there is one higher source. And as, as soon as we see the commonalities, we can start to go deeper into our path and we get hijacked on our spiritual path with hate for other traditions or hate for people that are different from me. Instead of seeing how do we, we have so much in common, it's a better way to frame out the world, to look at the world. What do I have in common with some, someone who appears to be different from me? So you get there, you become a monk. What do you do all day? <laughs> Everybody always asks that. Um, well, I think it really depends. Uh, you know, you could ask me personally, but I think it depends also uh, what particular 
ashram you're in. Um, in my ashram, uh, where I learned, I learned everything because I was in a bhakti ashram, a Krishna bhakti ashram. So the the idea of meditation is not just sitting in silence. It's 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 um, singing is a type of meditation. Japa, which is a classic type of meditation in India for Hindus and Buddhists, which is a uh, quiet meditation on malas or what you'd call an Indian rosary. Um, even cooking, I learned how to cook in an ashram, as well as learn classical music instruments. Um, you study sacred literature. Uh, you go to bed early. You rise super early. You have a whole morning educate morning time. And then depending on where then depending on where you are in your spiritual path, you have a different like service or offering. And it wasn't until a few years later that of studying the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, which is one of the classic texts within Hindu culture, it teaches that we don't give up what we're good at. See, I gave up what I was good at. I was a good communicator. I was a good songwriter. I was a good front man for the band. <clears throat> but it seems like those the things you're good at can also, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners can relate to this, sometimes when you get good at what you do, that very thing that you like to do, you can become overwhelmed, frustrated, competitive. You can experience backbiting or getting stabbed in the back. Or sometimes you get possessed by greed or uh, lust or... Uh, envy. And so I was getting frustrated within my community. So I just sort of cut it and walked away from it. And at that point, I realized that this was a type of false renunciation. I have to take what I do, take what I'm good at, take what I was you know, blessed with and use it in a spiritual way. Even though what I was doing was a good thing, like we didn't take drugs, we didn't you know, I wasn't snorting cocaine backstage after the show. We were like clean living. Like this seems like a very good thing. But what happens is on, on our spiritual path, it's not just cutting out the gross um, intoxicants that cloud your vision, cloud your thoughts, lead you into illusion and dis, you know, derail, derail and maybe sink you even deeper or cause addictions, et cetera. But it's to do some inner engineering of our consciousness. That's what our spiritual path is. How can I uproot things like greed? How can I uproot things like envy? How can I let go of anger or um, learn how to forgive? This is a big part of our spiritual um, creating a garden bed, so to speak, so our spiritual life can start to blossom. That was the real work. And this continuously the real work it, it, it's it's a lifelong work in progress actually i don't feel saved so to speak i feel like we are works in progress and we have to push ourselves to evolve every day and every moment of every day we feel saved like sometimes a christian will say well i'm saved i'm saved jesus saves me i don't have to worry about my sins i understand that to some degree but we can't be irresponsible in our behavior we have to be responsible about our actions and our choices. And I do believe there is some type of reaching out by our source or reaching down, but we also have to reach up on a regular basis. We have to make good choices on a regular basis. We have to elevate our consciousness. We have to surround ourselves by people who lift us higher. During your studying of meditation while you were there, were you ever taught how to have out-of-body experiences? I think the entire process of meditation is an out-of-body experience. Because we're not trying to merely, I say merely, it's a very big thing, to merely calm the mind. I say merely because most minds are like static out of control can't sit peacefully we're not trying to merely have a silent meditation where we hold the mind our meditation is on a form or a deity of god and in india they have different forms or deities that are objects of meditation and that is out of a physical realm and it's out of a mental realm it's actually a spiritual realm and the ideas were 
projecting ourself in service of God or of that form. So I would say the entire thing is out of body. There are ways where you can, it's not only out of body, it's out of the universe. It's out of the material realm. The interesting thing about Vedic thought is it speaks a lot of what is described. The Christians, or Judeo-Christian culture would speak of a heaven or a hell. The, they have a whole Vedic cosmography, which is very, very interesting, how every planet has life on it. Now, this might sound crazy, but I think it sounds even more crazy to say that we're the only type of intelligence in the, in the entire cosmos. I think that's actually much more of a fanatical statement and, and, or an arrogant statement. But they say that living entities exist everywhere. And they say that every planet is like either a higher place, like the, they say there's three planetary systems, places like our planet. And then what is our planet like? We experience heavens and we experience hells on this planet. You could go to the Congo, which is like the rape capital of the world. Horrible. You know, right? You could go to um, a penthouse in a beautiful city somewhere, or you could uh, be uh, just have an ordinary life. This is what earth is like. We experience heaven and hell sometimes in one day. We have, you know, we're experiencing the highest types of joy. And then all of a sudden we could be uh, under a terrorist attack and running for our life. So that's like a middle planet. But then they speak about higher planets, what the Christians would call heavens, where you, 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 your enjoyment is more refined. You live a longer life. Um, and then, of course, there's planets of pain. All of the planets, including the Earth, obviously, are not eternal. They're places where we do time, and hopefully we learn lessons. And that's our idea of our life in this body, is that we're not just here to have a good time. We're here to learn. We're here to grow. We're here to evolve. We're here like we're doing time to learn our lessons so we can go back out into the real world. This is not a real world, the yogis say. This is a matrix world. This is a dream world. And why is it a dream? Because it's temporary. I think it's safe to say if you've been in a relationship, a marriage, or even dated someone for two years or five years, and now you're in a new relationship or a new marriage, it's almost like looking back at that last relationship. It's almost like it was a dream. It's hard to even, even though you were day to day, hour to hour, sometimes texting your beloved, you look back at it now and it's like, wow, it's foggy. That's because the yogis say it was a dream. And it's, it's dreamlike because it's temporary. Just like we have a dream at night and we we think that dream is very real. We we dream we're very fortunate. We dream we're in, in great, you know, going through great distress. And we wake up and we're relieved from that distress. I had a dream the other day that a, a pack of dogs was chasing me and my heartbeat was racing. I was I woke up sweating. Now, where are those dogs? They're not even here. I've, I've fabricated it in the mind. They say that the material world is a fa fabrication, like almost a dream of the soul. And it's a dream because it's temporary. But they say there is a reality. And that's our connection out of these three planetary systems to a spiritual realm. So the goal of yoga and what we know of yoga in the West, it's very good for the physical body. It's very good to calm the mind. It's very good for the nervous system. All those things you get. But what it's meant for is, it to, is to remember what we've forgotten. And what we've forgotten is there's a genuine identity underneath this temporary identity. There's a genuary, genuine reality underneath this matrix of the dream that we're living in right now that's appearing so solid. It's so funny. This world appears solid and there's nothing solid about it. This is the myth. They talk about a spiritual myth and uh, you guys have your head in the sand and you know you guys got to get real. You're living in some pie in the sky. No, the material world is, you have faith in the material world, you fool. Are you crazy? 
Everything crumbles around you. Even if you analyze it, the, the, this table that I'm sitting at right now, it's not solid. Subatomic particles could fly right through this table. We're not seeing what's really happening. We're seeing from a subjective human lens. And there is an objective view of reality. And, it, and, and quantum mechanics, and uh, they, they're all catching up with what the yogis taught millennia ago. Some of my near-death experience guests will talk about how when they're on the other side, they have or experience death of the ego. And we also talk about that in order to in exist in this realm, you have to have ego. It's just part of being here. Mm. So what, in your opinion, what's the best way to manage the ego while we're here? That's a great question and a, and a very deep question because there are philosophies that say you have to crush the ego, kill the ego. But once you're embodied, you need the ego. You couldn't exist in this world. But but the idea in bhakti yoga is that we have to take this ego, this false understanding. The ego just means the, the, your personality, your yourself. So if I think I am my career, it's temporary. I can always get laid off. If I think I am, uh, um, um, uh, I'm a property owner, I'm a Democrat or a Republican, or I'm an American, these things are all sort of temporary. Uh, we can think I'm an athlete. We can think I'm a punk, right? Any temporary identity is not you. The yogis say you're not a body. You're not your mind. You are actually something divine. You're a spiritual being. So I have a, an identity with a small I, like I'm a father, okay? So just because I'm a father, I have roles to play as a dad. You know, I have some responsibilities, but I also have a capital I identity, which is I'm a spiritual being connected to God. And I don't own these children and I don't own this house in the bigger sense of own. I don't own anything in this world because I'm going to have to lose everything. I didn't create it and I can't maintain, I can't maintain it because it'll all be taken away from me. So my capital I identity is my real identity. And I can't be neglectful of my small I identity. I, I can't tell my children, okay, go play in the traffic. You're not my children. I don't own you. No, I have responsibilities of this world. And the responsibilities of this world will lead us to our real I identity. So that's why on a regular basis in our tradition, we cultivate wisdom. We go through this world with our small I identity. I'm a husband or I'm a father, or I'm a wife, or I'm a, in this position, but I understand deeply there's another thing going on. And that way, when the shifting sands of this material world happen, or when the, the sinkhole of material existence falls out under your feet, we're not so blown away. We understand, oh, I get it. This material world was never, I've been cultivating this intelligence. The material world was never solid. The only thing I have is that is my connection. So on a regular basis, we study this temporality of material existence. We go through our duties of giving love as people enter into our life. But we understand, truthfully, nothing here is ours. We can't control everything. People come into our life. We give some love. Uh, we take care of ourselves. We treat people with dig dignity. But we don't own anything. And therefore, when the material world crumbles, which it does, no one gets a pass on the crumbling state of material existence. That's what we've opted in for. When that happens, we're a little bit more prepared and a little bit more balanced. And it helps to have a community of people in our lives that helps support us and buoy us when things get very tough. Where does happiness come from? Mm. Good question. Because we're already, by the way, this this is the teachings of ancient India that I'm sharing with you. And of course, I'm not going to give you my perspective, but I will interpret what the teachings of ancient India say, that the soul is naturally blissful. 
it just gets covered over and it starts to live in the mind. And the mind can focus on the, the, the future and the past. And I find in my own life that when I really focused on the past and I'm really focused on the future, it cheats me out of the now and it cheats me out of the joy of just being. And you'll hear different spiritual teachers talk about the importance of the now and to be here now and to not live in your mind. And it's I can see in my own life, this is so true. How many times have you worried about something, maybe even for a year, that never ended up happening? It's like, what a waste of an, what a waste, what an investment in a, in a penny stock uh, with no return on investment, worrying about something that never happened. So uh, if I'm in the now, if I'm in the present, it becomes very, very powerful. And you start to experience the self, which is very joyful. Not only that, but finding your service within this world to God, which comes in the form of humanity as well. And you, you find joy in that as well. We're not looking for just a dopamine dump. We want happiness through service to God and service through all living beings. And personally, that's where I find my joy. And we all have some talent of what we're good at to use. I just met a gardener who's, who, who he was doing it in an ashram for a spiritual purpose. And he was doing it to serve the plants and the people that go to that ashram. And I was thinking, what a joyful life this guy has. It doesn't look like he had much money. He just liked what he was. He, he could have been. He could have been very wealthy. But I just could tell that this guy just loves what he does. So I think it's important to find what you're good at and take that, take what you're good at and offer it in service. And that's how we let go of all those things that drag, drag us down, the competition or, or the, the profit and um, the envy of others doing it too. You'll want to include others in what you're doing. Do you think there's an end point to reincarnation? And if so, where do we go next? Mm. Uh, another good question, and the Vedic teachings teach of this. There is innumerable universes of planets, and there's certain yoga process that take you to heavens, similar to what Christ spoke of heavens. There's planets, they say, of liberated souls. There's planets where the enjoyment is incredibly refined. And there's also planets that are like... Um, uh, dark, where they don't worship a divinity, um, uh, uh, what we would call like demonic or atheistic planets. Uh, um, and, and so cer certain people like to, they, they, there's yogic processes where you can leave your body and travel to these planets. I'm not interested in that because there's, uh, you know, there's, there's one beautiful book that I study called the Bhagavad Gita teaches the opening, one of the opening gambits of the book is from the highest planets to the lowest planets, they're all temporary. And so if you're really intelligent, you want to get out of this roller coaster of ups and downs of the material world. I've seen this happen in this life. Sometimes we get great fortune, and we're really happy, and then we lose everything, we become very sad. Better, they say, the Gita says this, better, they say, look for something that is eternal. Don't just try to find happiness through stuff of this world or refined living. Try to, try to find your refined happiness. So the Bhagavad Gita teaches, how do you escape this cycle of being born, going up, and then going down, and then being born and dying and born? The, the Hindus and the Buddhists call this samsara. And the idea is that the soul is eternal and the body is temporary, that we don't have a soul. We are a soul. We are a soul that has a temporary body. And the soul, my soul, even in this lifetime, if you don't believe this, you got to understand, even in this lifetime, I've reincarnated. And material science will say, well, yeah, your pancreas is not the same pancreas you had 20 years ago. And your lungs are not the same lungs. And your spleen and your heart, it, because every time I consume something, it changes a part of me. And every time waste is eliminated from the body, it, it, it lets go of something. Every time I cut my hair, I'm letting go of a part of me. 
the soul is just witnessing all these changes. So I'm reincarnating in this body. That's how the that's how the Gita teaches it. For any pe people skeptic of, well, I don't believe I'm going to die and come back like a goose or a queen or a pharaoh or a, you know, we, we all have these like very, very elaborate ideas of what do we want to be. I want to be a bird. And if you don't believe, and if it, that, that sounds too far-fetched, I get it. How do we know? Well, here's one way you can know. We have seen our body change in this lifetime from childhood to youth, to middle age life, to old age life, we witnessed our body grow. Not only that, we've witnessed our mind change. Do you remember your 17 year old mind? We've, we've witnessed our 25 year old mind or our seven year old intelligence. So the mind, the intelligence, the ego, these are all our subtle body. Our gross body and our subtle body are constantly changing. And the yogis say that when the soul leaves the body, when the, the body becomes dysfunctional, when the, when the car, you know, the engine block seizes, right? Sometimes the car, you just can't repair it, right? So when the body comes to this point, it just is irreparable. The soul leaves the body. Like it's been traveling through your bodies for lifetimes. And then it enters a new body, seed, egg, whatever. It's life. It's a life. It's an energetic force animating dead matter. My body is just dead matter. For example, if there's a dead Raghunath on the floor, that's me, Raghunath. If there's a dead Raghunath and a live Raghunath, it's the same Raghunath. But the eyes of Raghunath don't see on the dead body. The tongue does not taste. The ears do not hear. Why? Because there's no self. There's no soul. There's no Atma, the yogis say. The Atma is what's doing the tasting, what's doing the seeing. It's the person behind the hardware of the computer. So does it ever end? It can seem like lifetimes where we're caught up in this matrix of ex existence. But there is a final resting place. And that's a whole other story. And, and um, in, in our tradition, that is called um, going back to the spiritual, going back to the spiritual realm, being with, being an associate of God, and there is some type of loving relationship that you can have, and that's a whole very deep esoteric subject. But all the great sages have written; you can find out about it. Well, you were a monk for six years. How do you come to the decision that? Your time is up, and it's time to reincarnate back to New York. <laughs> well, I, I will say just to uh, as a little bit of a spoiler for the book, I didn't spend my entire time, the six and a half years in India. I would go back and forth to ashrams in America. I had a whole nother second unprecedented historical in the history of Vedic monks, but the Gita taught me to do a whole nother band because I said that was what I was good at. So I started a second band. But the message was a more spiritual message. So in one sense, I was living a cloistered life. But then I would go out in the world and I would tour with other monks that were musicians. You're going to have to read the book to believe the story. <laughs> but um, um, there was a time when a senior monk asked me, hey, are you going to get married ever? Are you thinking about it? And I felt I felt happy as a, you know, a celibate monk in my 20s. Um, I felt happily engaged in my service, and I, I liked what I do, and I liked the people I was around. But I thought, you know, I'd probably like to be a father. I think that's part of my calling. And I, I'd probably like the co the company of a partner. And, and he said to me in a very mature way, he said, well, you might want to think about doing it. Because he said, I've seen monks try to like with an ego trying to hold on to being detached from the world, but their, it wasn't their calling. And then they lose their footing in both worlds. They're not a good monk because they're thinking, I want to get married. I want to get married. I, I can't get married. Marrying, getting married is bad. And then what happens is they lose touch with the material world and they can't figure out how to, you know, you've lived in an ashram so long, you almost become dysfunctional in the material world had that experience too, or seen that experience. So he said, you might want to think about integrating 
a spiritual practice into a household or life. And so that was a, and that's a whole nother different discipline. Can I be in this world, but not of this world? And that's a very, very, also very challenging path to walk. It's not like it's an easy way out. If you, if you want success on that path, there's disciplines that go with it, you know, because you have to, it, it, it's like um, seasoning food. You want to put some salt on the food because so suppose you're a father. You can't, if you're too strict with your children, they, they, they'll rebel often. But if you're too um, lenient with them and you don't give them any type of spiritual discipline, then they don't, they don't learn, you know, what you're trying to give them. So it's, it's got to be a delicate balance of giving a, enough. The analogy of salt I like is you put a little bit on and it adds some flavor. But if you put too much on, you ruin the taste. And if you put nothing on, it perhaps is too bland for someone to eat. It's a path in and of itself. Do you think that the true test of the teachings that somebody would learn as a monk is to return to the material world and see if they're able to apply them and walk still a spiritual path? Good question. I've, I've met some people that their calling was to be was to be a monk in this. They have some karma, and you can find that out in a good Vedic astrologer. You know, you get some karma and they can see, oh, this person is meant to run a business. You can just see it in, in their makeup. This person is meant to entertain or to communicate. This person's got a priestly karma. This person's a businessman. This person's a renunciate. You know, sometimes you'll meet a kid in high school. They just didn't date. They weren't necessarily gay or they just didn't, but they just weren't like, they didn't have that strong Venus in their life. They were more like a hermit. And um, they could be like, a, you could consider them in the material world like a weirdo or an introvert. But the, this might be a calling to be a, a type of a monk where you can live alone, introverted and self-reflective and have a lot of uh, depth with you. And the, the spiritual world welcomes that person they don't ostracize that person but that doesn't mean it's for everyone so i don't think it is for everyone but i think for most people we're going to have families households etc and we're going to try to bring in spirituality into our life i wouldn't recommend everybody becoming monks but it was a good sort of education for me and i i liked what i did and was necessary for for me and my path I was checking out some of your new music on YouTube, and it sounds like th that you open up your show with a mantra or something. Is that what's going on? <laughs> yeah, thanks. We open up uh, with these Vedic mantras, and uh, in the night, it, it, the sound has a very purifying effect. I mean, it, it depends what type of sound, of course. Um, sound can have a degrading effect. Sound can have a make you angry, or sound can uplift you. So the, 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 the Vedic teachings are all in the science of incantations and sounds. And um, I like to play these at night sometimes before I go to bed. I like to play them in the morning. Um, at a time, they're like sort of, I'd like to play them truthfully, these kirtans in the backdrop, almost like this, run, run them as a soundtrack to my life. Um, it, it is very, very powerful, very beautiful, very ancient. Like, Very uplifting. Your book is called From Punk to Monk. If people want to find out more about it, should they go to Amazon or your website? Go to Amazon, amazon.com, and just uh, look up Ray Capo, Punk to Monk. You can go to my Instagram, which is Raghunath, R-A-G-H-U-N-A-T-H, Yogi, Raghunath Yogi. Or my website is Raghunath, R-A-G-H-U-N-A-T-H, dot yoga. And so, you know, you get to know me from the website and from the pictures on the Instagram. Um, and uh, I do retreats, I do trainings, I do really transformative pilgrimages. That's one of my favorite things to do in India and in Nepal. I'll take a group to Nepal this year to holy places and we'll go trekking. 
And it's a, it, it, it's very powerful. And I think it's, it, it has a, some souls in this world get a calling to that. And uh, I love facilitating it. And I, I love it because I was also, I, I'm also still a pilgrim. I love going to these places and I find them very transformational. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Sure. Um, you can change your life instantly by giving up complaining. Complaining for your situation. Complaining that persons, places, or th things are making you sad. Take full responsibility for our sadness in this world and then move forward from there. Never blame. Never blame. It will not help us in our lives. Always look, whatever I got, I got now. How can I use that to move forward and evolve? If I can keep that sort of at the forefront of my, my mind, nothing will disturb me. Nothing's happening to me. It's all happening for me. Raghunath, thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest. <laughs> thank you. Great show. I'm actually about to download a bunch of your episodes. I'm going to listen to them on my flight okay. from uh, San, to San Francisco. Oh, I have over a thousand there, so <laughs> I hope you enjoy them. <laughs> Thanks, my friend. I have a podcast I want to give a shout out to. Sure. It's a it's also a daily study mm -hmm. of yoga bhakti philosophy, and it's called Wisdom of the Sages, and you can get it wherever you uh, get podcasts or on YouTube. All right, great. If people want to reach out to you and ask you questions, are you open to that? Yeah, try through my website or on Instagram. I try, try, to, I try to be responsive. Cool. Well, Raghunath, thanks again. I wish you massive success in whatever you're doing. Thanks so much. Keep up the good work. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.